Welcome back to Modern Medea with a podcast, or welcome. Yes, I'm Megan. And I'm Ello. And today we have the most amazing guest on yes. the show. We are beyond thrilled to share our conversation. It's more a conversation, I think, than an yeah. interview. <laughs> with Professor Emeritus Stephen Murray, who was, and is, I guess, arguably, a yeah. Gothic architecture historian he taught at Indiana University and then at Columbia University for over 30 years. He has a 50 plus year academic career that we learn a lot about. Yeah. And he's just generally amazing. <laughs> yes, he's a wonderful person to listen to. So much so that we couldn't edit the interview we yeah. had with him. So it is quite long. So it, be prepared. Dip in and out, but enjoy it. Yes. So without further ado, here is our conversation with Professor Emeritus Stephen Murray. Hello. Welcome. Yeah, hello. I'm, I'm Stephen Murray, uh, Professor Emeritus, a former professor, well, always a professor. And I taught at Columbia University um, uh, most recently. Uh, but my teaching actually spans a much longer time for almost 50 years, beginning in London, as I'll tell you. And um, during that time, I've been the luckiest professor uh, in the sense that I've had uh, almost 50 graduate students to work with over the years. And I'm very, very proud of them. Um, that they've managed to find themselves jobs. And um, as I tell my story, in fact, I, I want to end with the fear that that period um, was an extraordinarily fortunate period. And whether is it how are we going to make it continue? But if you like, I'll begin at the beginning and tell you how I started. Yes, please. Yes, yep. please. And before we jump into that, just really quick, we are so honored and thrilled to have you here. Absolutely. Thank and you so much. Yes, thank you. And to hear your story, because yes. based yeah. off yesterday when we had our sound check and you were talking about how you rode your motorcycle yes. around France in your PhD, we want to hear more. Yeah, about we definitely that. do. <laughs> <laughs> so please continue and thank you. The academic side of it, because you asked me first to, to describe my academic career, I was at Keble College, Oxford, um, which was an enormous joy and a great privilege in the 1960s. Um, it was a very earnest kind of place. Uh, I was in history schools there and was lucky enough to work with an astonishing professor. Uh, as you know, one is very impressionable as an undergraduate. And I was bowled over with admiration of Eric Stone, my, my teacher. He was a Welshman and he had this wonderful, gentle voice, a bit like Anthony Hopkins. <laughs> <laughs> and in that wonderful British way, um, he was the most erudite and brilliant man in the world, uh, but never felt it necessary to publish very much. And so in his whole life, he published one great formative article, which I'll describe to you a little bit later on, but he was an economic historian. And he brought, uh, he'd been at Manchester, he'd taught for a while at Manchester before coming to Keep. And uh, uh, he'd been deeply um, influenced by his time in, in Manchester. Uh, but he taught me to, a particular approach to history, which uh, I will elaborate on a, a bit um, later. So from Keble College, I went to the Courtauld Institute uh, in London mm -hmm. uh, from 1967 to 1970. And uh, again, the most erudite man in the world in that, in that, in that field was Peter Kidson. Peter Kidson. Didn't publish very much either. But just... <laughs> Just was brilliant, and uh, somehow he induced us. He had a terrific batch of students. Um, I was one of many, and um, he induced us to look intensely at buildings. So from there, in those days back there in Britain in the 1960s, one had graduate fellowships, and um, I don't know if that exists anymore, but uh, I had a, a fellowship from the state that paid for my PhD work. It ran out, of course. <laughs> At least you had it to start, though. Yeah, that's quite good. <laughs> After three years, I needed to find a job. And uh. this was in 1970. And in the, in the end, an offer uh, came very, in a belated way, from Manchester uh, University. Um, but in the meantime, I'd been swept off my feet by Indiana University Bloomington. Mm -hmm. um, but the, even before going to Bloomington, I had taught for a while at Morley College. Do you, have you heard of Morley College in London? Sounds kind of familiar, but yeah. I couldn't well, say off the top of my head. It's one of those surprises. It's a, it's a jewel of a place, assuming it exists still, on the South Bank. And oh. it's probably 
part of the University of London. And I taught an extension class there in 1969. And my students were adults in their 40s and 50s and so on. And they must have felt sorry for me because they adopted me. (laughs) (laughs) We had such a lovely year and we took as a project St. Bartholomew's in Smithfield. And so we spent a lot of time in St. Bartholomew's and uh, did a little exhibition. And then we rented a bus and drove our bus up around Yorkshire and looked at um, uh, Yorkshire Abbeys. Then came came the offer from uh, Indiana uh, Bloomington. And there'd been an Englishman there whose name was Alan Borg. And uh, he'd been enormously successful and popular. And he left at very short notice to go to uh, Princeton. And at that time, it was June, I guess, of uh, 1970. They simply lifted the phone to London and said, send another one over. (laughs) (laughs) So um, uh, that's what I mean when I say, in a way, I was so very fortunate. You know, in, in terms of generations, my generation is known as the fortunate few. It precedes the baby boomers. Because, of course, with the baby boomers, there were far too many. Right. But um, <laughs> with the fortunate few, there was a shortage of PhDs in uh, in the United States. And a number of us went over. Some of us stayed and some of us didn't. But Alan Borg, in the end, came back. He became keeper of the Queen's armour in England in the end. Uh, Richard Morris went over for a while. Alison Stones went over and stayed. And I went over. And um, I found American uh, higher education very stimulating. Uh, in the sense that there was an enthusiasm about the material, which I'm sorry to say was not altogether present <laughs> in the hallowed halls of Oxford and uh, and the Courtauld Institute. And uh, I was surprised to find how excited my students became about medieval architecture. And um, in my, uh, what can I say, in my arrogance, I guess, I went to the dean at Indiana as a young, un- untenured professor, and I said, I want to build the best medieval architecture program in the United States. And the Dean said, well, what do you need to do that? And and I said, I I have to take my students to France. I can't teach them without showing them the buildings. And so we built a summer program in the the, the capital of Champagne, Troyes. I don't know if you've been to Troyes, uh, but it's the most gorgeous city. And for two months at a time, uh, I'd be there with my students, and uh, it produced a, a whole spate of PhDs and MA theses and some, uh, including some of the leading people in the field of, of Gothic architecture. Michael Davis, a um, great scholar of Gothic, had his beginnings there. So Indiana gave me a kind of joy in teaching and being with my students. And I think the American approach, in some ways, um, is better than the British, because um, in those days, the teaching of the practice of art and the study of the history of art in England was completely separate. Mm. And uh, America is more likely to combine those things. So when I went to Bloomington, I found myself in with the sculptors and the painters and the printmakers. And in some ways, I found them more interesting than the art historians. <laughs> Fair enough. Like John Ruskin, uh, I, mm-hmm. I do believe you, you've got to make objects. You've got to build mm-hmm. things. You've got to make things in order to understand them. Most definitely. Um, I'm not sure you said you listened to an episode or two of ours, one of my new PhD um, cohort members, Joe, he's doing his PhD now, but he started off as a craftsman. Yeah. So working with manuscripts, iron smithing was kind of the trade he was in. And he's now mm-hmm. considering objects, their ontology, and them as kind of active participants in history. But he's exactly kind of what you're saying. He has this lived and embodied kind of practical experience with the material that allows mm-hmm. him to see it and articulate it so much differently than yeah someone who has just studied kind of armchair way with the books and yes. the practice of it yeah yeah and uh, it, it, one as a professor can live in a place like Bloomington, indiana Whereas living for a professor at Harvard or Columbia or Berkeley is very hard because we can't afford the houses we'd mm-hmm. like yeah. to live in, you know. And uh, there in Bloomington, uh, my wife and I, and I met my wife um, in Bloomington, and she's Irish. Uh, oh, really? like, oh. like me, had, had escaped and took to the States. And um, we bought a house. We had, had two children. And um, it just seemed like heaven for many, many years, 16 years I was at, um, at Indiana. Continuing forward on the uh, trajectory, uh, in 1980, so I went to Indiana in 1970, in 1980, I got offered a job at Berkeley uh, to replace uh, Jean Bonny, who was one of the great, great 
pillars of Gothic um, historiography in, at that time. So I went to Berkeley and spent two days house hunting. And uh, this was yeah. in 1980. And I, I very quickly realized I just couldn't afford it. You know, uh, houses at that time were you know, beginning at $300,000 um, or so. And um, uh, the salary would not uh, cover. Yeah, not, they offered me no kind of help with the mortgage. So in the end, I stayed at Indiana. And um, but, you know, that adventure made me feel big, 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 a little bit um, as though Indiana wasn't enough for me. You know, uh -huh. uh, I, I became chairman uh, and then I turned the department into a school of fine arts. So um, I was the first director of the School of Fine Arts. Wow. And, and I set up three departments under my direction. One was Studio 2D, painting, printmaking and so on. Uh, the other was Studio 3D, pots and um, sculpture and textiles and so on, and the other was art history. And um, for a while, this um, seemed um, really very, very wonderful. I then got invited to go to Harvard and, 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 and join the tradition of Kingsley Porter, Arthur Kingsley Porter, one of the great historians of architecture, and Kenneth Conant. And uh, Harvard, have you been to Harvard? Harvard Yard, it's heaven. <laughs> I, I thought that this was my place, you know. Yeah, it is beautiful. It is yeah. breathtaking. Yeah. But I've not been. Yeah. Um, so that's I, it. Visiting is nice. They gave, <laughs> but... <laughs> yeah. they, they gave me off an office in the art museum there. I had a very happy, in fact, two visits. Uh, but the offer never came through. Wow. And then in, in 1980, um, actually, an offer came through from Columbia. Mm -hmm. I hadn't thought to come to New York. Quite frankly, I'm not a big city kind of guy. I, I, I like a smaller city to live in, and uh, in New York had never really attracted me all that much. But this was Robert Branner's position in the field of medieval architecture. Robert Branner in the 1960s was a godlike figure. He was more productive, more dynamic than any other scholar in the field. And in, in my own education uh, with Peter Kidson in London, nearly all my seminar projects were critiquing Robert Branner. Uh, because he, he was the, the, the most uh, dynamic uh, scholar in the field. So to be in Robert Branner's um, position, he had died in 1973, uh, one cannot turn that down. So yeah. I, I came to um, New York with two small children, and I couldn't afford my house, <laughs> and I couldn't afford schools for the children, and so we bought this house out um, I'm 50 miles north of the city. Yeah. And so for 30, how many years is it, 32 years, um, I've been going up and down. It's a 50 mile um, trip into the, into work. And oh I, my gosh, that sounds I, quite intense. Yeah. I train, I buy motorcycle. Really? Um, yeah. How um, long did that yeah. take? Because 15 miles doesn't so sound in theory, of course, very far. Is it like, but you have to deal with Manhattan traffic. <laughs> yeah, Manhattan traffic. On the motorcycle, I only do that once or twice. It's, that was no fun at all. <laughs> oh, um, I can imagine. <laughs> So I've been driving and um, I calculate I've driven to the moon oh. uh, and, and back. What? <laughs> and, uh, obviously, this was one reason why I, in the end, decided to retire. Although I, I'd reached a good age, but I just got tired of driving up and down. Uh, I've got a 200 foot driveway outside and uh, when it snows, which it does a great deal. I've got to clean up my driveway before I can even get on the road. Um, and then 50 miles by sea roads. So that's it down to the present. So um, uh, Columbia was a, a great place to be and uh, it gave me all kinds of wonderful opportunities. And um, uh, it wasn't easy. Uh, if you're looking for a, uh, an easy kind of academic life, Columbia is not the place to come to. It's, uh, but uh, it certainly does make you run harder and faster than you think you, you really wanted to, you know? Blessing in disguise. There we are, bless, blessing in disguise. That is so extraordinary. I and I loved your um, tidbit about how when or antidote when you went to Indiana and said, "I want." Yeah, it's amazing. This and yeah. that they were on board. Yeah, it's extraordinary. I tried the same trick at Columbia. <laughs> and, different story and, 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 I'm a very busy person get out of my office and go somewhere <laughs> um, well wow yeah thank you this thank is... you that's amazing just all of that my mind is in Love awe <laughs> and churning so one thing that's also been a large kind of part of your academic trajectory and everything is that you have 
always seem to be an advocate for using the technology, the material that's been available and, you know, really wanting to use that to complement traditional teaching styles. So kind of when, I guess, computers or scanning. Right, and, right. And so along with this book project, which is initially how we got introduced to you, your book on uh, the Omyon Cathedral, um, you created this amazing website to go along with it that has extraordinary photos, panoramas, 3D scans, floor plans. The section on uh, dynamic geography was blowing my mind because I am not an architect and just watching all that unfold. And so I was just wondering if you could elaborate more on your relationship to technology and yeah. Yes. Well, in a sense, uh, I, I listened to your podcast. I think it was you talking, Megan, wasn't it, uh, about Catholic high school? Was that you? Or was that yes, no. that was me. <laughs> that was you. Well, it, it, as you realise, these things go back to that kind of phase. And my father was an Anglican minister. Um, going to church, it wasn't ostensibly obligatory. I mean, I, nobody ordered me, but somehow it's what, what you did. Mm -hmm. And um, so I spent an awful lot of my childhood uh, in churches and frankly the liturgy bored bored me to death <laughs> yes uh, <laughs> i understand the, so what one would do sitting there in the pew unable to move is scan the building with your eyes uh, uh, and um in a sense one would take flight one would take flight um and my father filled in for uh, other vicars who were absent he had a little church at uh, near redditch in, in Worcestershire, called Headless Cross, little Romanesque revival church. And there was a niche space up there. And in my mind, I'd soar up and I'd sit in the niche, you know, free of the um, liturgy. And I could look out and scan the building. And um, so that whole idea of animation, animating a building, which is what film and, um, uh, and uh, video does, uh, goes that back that far. And then a chance to really put this into practice came when I was at um, Oxford and one year ahead of me was a group of people who had, in fact, two of them, had in their hitchhiking in the, in the, uh, in the Near East, in Anatolia, in fact, had come across the uh, medieval city of, of uh, Ani, A-N-I, Ani, which was the capital of Armenia, which had flourished in the 11th century and where there are magnificent churches and, and city walls. It had been hit by an earthquake and abandoned, but the ruins are out there in this in this arid landscape. There is this city, and they had come up with the notion of, of um, raising some money. And um, we had an old Land Rover, an ancient old, had been, belonged to the electricity board, and we got some money from the Gulbenkian Foundation, and uh, we called ourselves the Oxford Eastern Black Sea Expedition. <laughs> 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 we none of us knew anything about it. But in the summer of 1966, we set out uh, and went to Armenia with a wind-up Bell and Howell camera, a film, movie camera, and a flimsy tripod. And we were going to make a movie for Traveller's Tales. BBC had a series called Tra <gasps> Traveller's Tales. So you went from Oxford to Armenia? Yeah. By car? Yes. How long did it take you? Sorry. Oh, um, two or three weeks. Wow. Uh, Must have been me, beautiful. Me, yeah. <laughs> To make it even more exciting, we actually got permission um, to cross the Soviet border. No uh, way! <laughs> what? And, um, at that point, I was going through a kind of Christian spell in my life, and I, I, I even thought of bringing a stack of Bibles with me and, uh, <laughs> in the Soviet Union. <laughs> but fortunately, we didn't do that. <laughs> The, the Land Rover broke down quite repeatedly, but we did get to Armenia and we did get to Ani and we had a Turkish military guard uh, to watch over us and they got bored for a while and they, so they, they wandered off. So we were left camping in the city and uh, we wound up our camera and we pointed it at the cathedral and it clicked and buzzed. And somehow you expect the cathedral to do something, you know, this is, right. this is a movie that we're making, but the cathedral, of course, didn't do it. It just it's there, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And at that time, um, it, it was a forcible way of, of, of telling me that if you're going to animate a building, mm -hmm. uh, the building doesn't move, you've got to move the camera. Mm -hmm. And somehow that need um, to make a building come alive with images and with words. Uh, the words come from another part of my background, which was my father being a preacher, was endlessly talking in the pulpit. 
and I'd visit churches with him. I remember going to Tewkesbury Abbey with him as a child. I wished he'd say something. You know, what is this? Um, tell me a little bit about the building. But he had nothing to say about the building. And mm. so, it, so it kind of compensates. This is a real Freudian story, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> As a compensate for my father, um, I found it necessary to begin to add, add words. So what are the words that we come up with for Armenian architecture? Uh, at Oxford, there was no history of art. History of art was not taught at that point. There was just an archaeology program that we all uh, belonged to, and a study group. And um, we presented an exhibition on uh, Armenian architecture. And my reading matter was an obscure, but not so obscure, actually, Austrian scholar, whose name was Josef Strigovsky. Okay. Uh, Str Strigovsky had written a book, and my German was quite good, and I read it, Die Balkons der Armenia. Um, it was translated into a, a, a form of uh, English, uh, Origins of Christian Church Art. And he came up with this great theory, which I didn't realize at the time how pernicious the theory was. Uh, and the, the theory was that the vaulted architecture of the Armenians represented a kind of Aryan thrust, dynamic, muscular, exciting, forward moving, that in the end would give us Romanesque and Gothic. And uh, th th this was then overlaid by the effete romance buildings, you know, these Italian wooden roof basilicas that were going nowhere, you know. <laughs> I, I, momentarily, I felt for some of this as, a, as an undergraduate until my tutor, the, the man I admired so much, Eric Stone, realized where I'd gone with it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> he quietly slipped me a reading which completely countered everything uh, I ever believed. So um, the trip to Armenia gave me the reason to want to animate buildings with words and with moving images. Mm -hmm. And that, that stayed in with me, uh, or stayed in uh, my mind. And there, when I went to Indiana, uh, as I say, I didn't bring the buildings to the, the students, I brought the students to the buildings. Mm -hmm. And uh, that really worked very well. It produced, as I say, a number of PhDs um, and a number of MA theses. But at the same time, at Indiana, right from the start, I tried to bring the very best slides. You know, you want know slides with mm. and slide machines? You push mm -hmm. and the slide this slid. Um, so we, we worked on the slide collection to improve it. Now, uh, all that uh, is part of the background. But the, the critical point was coming to Columbia University in 1986. Columbia has a thing called the core curriculum. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's a really enlightened um, idea that all undergraduates must apply they're obliged to take a course in art in philosophy in music in current events and so on and it produces a kind of breadth mm -hmm. and because we have considerable numbers it produces a need and uh, the work of uh, art that animates the, uh, the curriculum um, at uh, Columbia was Amiens Cathedral mm -hmm. so I started to try and muck around I couldn't bring all those students to Amiens. But I tried to bring Amiens to them in a more exciting way than with sides. Mm -hmm. So we started at Columbia. I, I made a few contacts and friends. We, we started to animate the building with video. And with the video camera, I managed to get um, a glide cam going. So we move the camera through the building. Mm -hmm. I begged from the filmmaker um, uh, the use of some steel rails. So we slid the camera through the building and um, uh, we did this under a grant from the National Endowment for the Humanities and it was successful uh, and people liked it. And at the same time, using a, um, a software program that was called Soft Image, I believe it was developed in Canada and with a colleague whose name is Rory O'Neill at, at Columbia, uh, we worked up an, an animation of Amia, of Amia, of the construction and the design uh, mechanism, the dynamic geometry that you find on, on the website. Mm -hmm. uh, this was in 1993, and it made an enormous sensation that the animation went to the Montreal Film Festival. Um, wow. it, got, uh, it got me featured in the uh, Chronicle of Higher Education, and it seemed like a huge breakthrough uh, in the way that we teach uh, architecture. Mm -hmm. Uh, and uh, NEH, again, the National Endowment for the Humanities, were so impressed with it, they offered me a challenge grant uh, that was worth millions um, to continue to do this kind of work. And my vision was to try and apply this approach to the entirety of the core curriculum, of which there are 12 components. It starts with the 
Parthenon, it goes on with the cathedral, it goes on with Raphael, Michelangelo, Bernini. It ends up with Frank Lloyd Wright, um, Jackson Pollock and um, Andy Warhol. And it seemed to me I could recruit my colleagues at Columbia and for each of these components, we could do a brief animation or little video that would run for 15 minutes or so that would really make that work of art come alive. Mm -hmm. I found to my amazement, my colleagues were not in the least interested. No, and, what? Really? Yeah. And this, this was in 1993 at the, at the dawn. In fact, this is pre-digital. Mm -hmm. and, oh. and because I had this nice grant uh, uh, with the um, promise uh, that I was going to do something to pull colleagues together in a collaborative sense, mm. uh, I, I realized that the way to go was not with, uh, with just um, my colleagues at Columbia, but I reached out to a, a broad range of colleagues and we invented a thing called the digital, the medieval architecture digital teaching project. And we were going to cover, we, we did complete the project, a thousand years of medieval architecture uh, in a single course wow. online. Uh, this was in 1995 or about that. And uh, we brainstormed the thing in the end uh, in the city of Granada, um, in, in a building overlooking the Alhambra. And uh, I summoned together, I got together about a dozen architectural historians, because when we teach medieval architecture, I'm awfully good at Romanesque and Gothic. I'm not so good at early Christian. Uh, so we have Dale Kinney there dealing with the early Christian. Uh, we had Jerry, Geraldine Dodds dealing with Islamic architecture. We had, um, Roger Staley dealing with Romanesque, and they were each going to design a component. And we would operate this course indefinitely, all responsible for our component, but then all of us enjoying online images, animations, primary sources, and uh, it worked. We, we brought the thing off. Some contributors contributed more than others, but for 20 years, I went on teaching that course using that website. So that goes back to the year, the year 2000 or so. Wow. And then, uh, and then beyond that, so now, by now the digital age is really taking off. Um, uh, between two thousand and two and two thousand and seven, I ran a digital program in central France in the Bourgogne, in the Bourgogne, which is just adjacent to Burgundy. Right. Um, it's a, a part of France that's not very well known, and it's a part of France that, in a sense, was frozen. It never developed great cities. As a result, it's dotted with Romanesque churches. Mm. And, uh, we decided we'd, we'd collect. 100 or more Romanesque churches. Uh, we would scan them with a laser. We would come up with a complete understanding of their design mechanisms. Uh, we would photograph them and we would put them with narratives on each of these church churches and we'd put them all on the great website. And it, it exists. But the discovery I made in that project is that websites become buggy very quickly. Mm -hmm. And unless somebody is, is constantly tending them, uh, the technology quickly becomes obsolete. And it, the problem with that project was that these are churches you've never heard of, and uh, they're considered dead-enders, you know, because Gothic is developing in the north, and here in the Bourbonnais, the builders just go on building those same little churches, and they're very charming. But the modern audience, art history is very elitist. <laughs> For sure, <laughs> yes. <laughs> We want to go to Beauvais Cathedral or Amiens or Westminster Abbey. We don't want to go to uh, Chimilly or Cresson or, or these little churches. I, I've never even heard of them. So in the end, we moved that project over to one uh, on Mapping Gothic <laughs> with, the, with the Mellon Foundation. And there, that worked um, very well for a while. And that was a very ambitious vision of a website. In fact, in retrospect, it was too ambitious because we used technology. We had a young man called Rob Stenson. He was an absolute whiz kid genius. And he came up with all these wonderful um, uh, mechanisms to allow you to drag a cursor and all the buildings built between 1160 and 1170 will show up on the map, but it was too complex. Mm. And as you know, if you've played with that website, it's getting buggy. It no longer really works as it was intended. The tragedy in that operation was death. I mean, it, it, I, I can't bear to talk about it, but I had a, a collaborator whose name was Andrew Tallon. Mm -hmm. and, um, quite unexpectedly, um, he died um, uh, two or three years ago, uh, a glioblastoma. But um, prior to that, um, incredibly, uh, two of the directors of the media center, which I had established, but I no longer directed it, but they also encountered tragedy. 
And uh, so the project seemed sort of done by, by this series of tragedies. And, um, and then, because I realized it was becoming buggy, um, I kind of turned my attention because I sensed I'm reaching the end of my career. I'd like to leave something a little bit more permanent. I don't know if this website is going to be there 10 years from now. So that was when I turned to my last three books. I've published three books already uh, on, on Trois, on Beauvais, and on Amiens, uh, monographs, essentially. But for my last three books, I turned to something quite different, which pulled me away from the digital media. And uh, uh, I'm, I hate to confess, but I'm actually technologically not very gifted. <laughs> so I, I, yeah, I don't yeah. do Facebook. I, I, I don't do any of these clever things. I admire you for setting up this podcast. This is wonderful. <laughs> Thank but, you. Uh, Thank you. I, I've never done that stuff. And uh, I always relied on working with people who did know how to do it. <laughs> <laughs> and quite frankly, it was a joy. It was a joy to work with those people. And I thought the whole fun of the thing was a collaborative team. Mm -hmm. But um, a little bit like a rock group, um, you know, like, <laughs> like the Beatles, they can't stay together. You know, in the end, there has to be a kind of falling apart. And uh, so my group in the end broke up. And still, uh, Rory O'Neill was my steady, steadfast friend in all this and he and I did the initial animation. He's still my dear, dear friend. I see him quite often. But uh, So that's my digital story. Um, but uh, what I used to say to my students in the, in the Book of Bonnet is in the end, it's not so much just production. In other words, it's not to do with producing the final uh, website. It's the process of, of how we produce it. Mm -hmm. So the students there in the field, excited by the new media, went into those buildings with a kind of zest and they saw them in a different kind of way. Mm -hmm. So I see the role of the digital uh, revolution, not just as what it's produced, but as a way of thinking and a kind of introducing enthusiasm and dynamism into a field. And my last three books that I referred to, I don't know that I could have written them without mm -hmm. the experience of the digital media. Do you think it's changed your way of Absolutely. viewing the cathedrals? Absolutely. I don't know if you read, ever read my Gothic sermon that came out in, my, in uh, 2004, but I begin the Gothic sermon imagining that I, I'm a film director. And uh, mm. so I, I say to you, I want to see this scenario. I want you to see a little church. It's full of people. And there's a crazy preacher up there. My gosh, he's eloquent. And he seems to understand what the congregation wants to hear. And he really can fire them up. And there's a woman in the congregation. He seems to speak especially to that woman over there, you know. And so I fire the uh, book up with this um, film scenario. And, um, uh, and then I get serious and say, look, all this, this is my scenario. But now come with me and look, let's look at the manuscript. It's in the Bibliothèque Nationale. So I transcribe it, I translate it, I um, put it in, in its context. But that's a film scenario. And in some ways, the book I've just, uh, this one, um, this is a film scenario when I talk about telling the story of the great enterprise. My son is a filmmaker. Oh. And, um, he was at uh, the Tisch School of the Arts at NYU and that now is in Hollywood, actually. He's one of the few people that studied film that actually went to Hollywood. <laughs> Congratulations to him. Yeah, good for him. And he's um, actually editing right now, but he had a number of books on filmmaking. And when he was an undergraduate, I read some of those books. And I, I quite consciously structured my um, scenario in this book uh, around a film script. That actually, you saying that, I that makes sense um, structurally. Like I can see that based off the general film theory classes that I've taken and yeah, yeah. examples. Um, really quickly, I am... Ello kind of asked it and you've mainly answered it, but I'm just really curious. So with like LIDAR, so it's this technology that in the past 10 years has exploded. Um, this is kind of a question also for my friend, Nick, who did an architectural history PhD recently. Um, and he was looking at LIDAR. So this scanning as a methodology, as a way to really deploy understanding of architecture. And yes. I was in the field with him. I, we actually did um, a scan of the outside of Drumlanrig Castle in Scotland. Yes, yes. And he was really interested in the arches and columns. Yes, yes. Um, and the faux columns there. But he was. we scanned the outside of this building over a span of, I think, five hours with the apparatus that I liked to call the virus because it was a tripod with the yes. rotating head. 
And so I was just curious about the um, using these technologies like LIDAR, which is laser scanning for our audience. Um, and I guess their use as tools, but also their potential as methodology, that step further. Yes, yes. Well, um, uh, you're, you're talking about laser scanning, right? Yes. Yeah. Well, um, uh, the, the, the instruments used um, were actually developed in California. And um, there was a company called Sarax based in Oakland, California. And uh, a colleague, uh, Peter Allen uh, at Columbia, acquired one, a first generation Sarax. It was the year 2000. And this was all absolutely new in 2000. And we took it to Beauvais and uh, we scanned Beauvais Cathedral with it. And uh, it produced a kind of sensation amongst those who came to watch us scanning. Because as you know, the, the thing, it strobes up and down mm -hmm. uh, on your computer screen, little dots. The point cloud, right? The point, yeah. The point cloud. And um, it's quite spectacular. And it, it makes the user think that, my God, this is magic. And uh, this is somehow the remedy, the, the final solution to understanding the building. And so that's what we experienced at Bourbonnais. And then in the mapping Gothic, we went on to use the scanner in the Bourbonnais. And uh, Andrew Tallon, unlike me, was enormously gifted technologically as well as um, in, in a humanistic sense. And he learned to use this, the um, scanner. It was no longer Sarex. It was a Leica geosystem scanner. Mm -hmm. And went on to scan Notre Dame of Paris and a number of other buildings. And, um, uh, and to come up with um, a way of looking... He called it spatial archaeology, mm. and, and um, it's a good way of looking. The, the only aspect that I, a little sad about is that in people's minds, it completely replaces the old manual measuring. Mm. Uh, and because it's complex and, and expensive, uh, it's not accessible to most people. And I always try to encourage my students that you can go into a church with a steel tape measure mm -hmm. and in several hours work, you can ex extract the key dimensions and the design mechanisms in that church. Nowadays, you think you've got to have a, a laser scanner and um, and then the, the, the point cloud data, as you know, is, is extremely difficult to manipulate. Yeah, um, very hard it, and very large files as very well. Very large files. So what you do um, is you get your plans and sections and you import it into um, a CAD program. And I've done some of that, but the CAD programs are also for a technologically challenged person. Uh, they're far more bells and whistles and, um, uh, and things than you ever need. So it's been a mixed blessing. Um, and the, 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 the plus side is that it allows you to control things that uh, manual um, uh, measuring can never do. Manual measuring mostly is, is what you can touch. Whereas the elevation in my cathedrals, I have um, dropped a 50 meter steel tape from the vaults with a lead weight on it to, to get the heights. No way. <laughs> uh, and uh, when Amiens was scanned by my colleague in, 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 in Amiens, um, he, he gave me the, um, the horizontal section, let's say the plan. And I have a full scale plan of Amiens that I measured out by hand, mm -hmm. and I superimposed my plan on his plan, and uh, we found that the laser plan actually is correct. Oh, wow. Yeah, that's the way I put it. Uh, that's the way he put it. Some people would say they found my hand-measured plan was correct. But, right. Um, <laughs> but anyway, I, they, 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 they fold it together. Uh, I mean, that's great. It's wonderful to see that um, the human way of measuring it out you know with as you said the tape measure or whatever kind of rods whatever it is that you're using and the technology do sync up um and with this i think this will be kind of a nice hinge for us talking a bit more about amya is um the way that scans and i'm curious about this can also see what the human eye cannot see so certain um perhaps the subtle curves it kind of brings out more or yeah, the, what's yeah. invisible and when you're thinking about this in relation to like a cathedral which is this material manifestation of kind of the ineffable right it's yeah. meant to extend towards god towards heaven towards all of that and scans in a way are making visible that which is invisible but mm -hmm. it's done in this virtual way 
Yes. Um, and I'm just kind of curious. That's kind of, I guess, more a comment than a question. But if you have a follow up <laughs> to that, <laughs> oh, I don't absolutely. know. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the the the, um, the metaphor that I've thought of, I'm not even sure it's a metaphor. The word literally is overused, as you know. But maybe we can literally uh, call these scans an, an achiropitas, the Byzantine icon, the achiropitas, is an image not made by human hands. Mm -hmm. you know? So an icon painted by uh, an icon of the Virgin Mary. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, where the, where the painter isn't the one that made it; it was made directly. Uh, by the Virgin Mary herself. Now, um, the scan is an achiropitas mm -hmm. in the sense it's not made by human hands. And um, so that's a similar line of thought to the one you've just expressed. And um, I've thought deeply about that for a long time. And the achiropitas is, is enormously powerful in the human mind, you know. Mm -hmm. But to, yeah. to, the extent, to the extent to which I think it demeans the, the serious work of people like myself, but generations before me who have uh, uh, sur surveyed these buildings actually quite accurately. Mm -hmm. and, uh, there is a tendency now to dismiss all that as unreliable. Now we can't trust that, and uh, I, th I think that's a bit of a mistake. I completely agree. agree. It's a mistake, especially looking at the care of this yeah. Amiens project that you've done and this monograph that you've produced, which is incredible, extraordinary. <laughs> and Elo and I are not architects we're not architectural historians at all <laughs> um, but you provide like a glossary and the way that you move around the cathedral and speak about it is so accessible and really poetic yeah. and beautiful and then the all the images that you provide I'm a very visual learner i since you took them yourself I'm assuming you were allowed to use many more images than sometimes when Yes. Authors are not using their own images, but it helped me navigate so much just the text itself. And then you have the wonderful website that goes with it that you reference on occasion. Plus, you have Mapping Gothic, which also has material on Amya. And a lot of this isn't the like LIDAR scanning or this high tech. It's mm -hmm. you with a camera that, yes, does have That's high it. That's it. resolution, yeah. but it's also your eye seeing yeah. these things and going, this demands a picture or yeah. an image to document and relay the information. Well, when I, I, I conceived of this book in, in, um, uh, in 2014, I, I had a term off teaching and I took a little apartment and lived in um, Amiens uh, uh, for a term. And I put the building back in my head because I'd been off do, doing all my digital projects. Mm -hmm. And at, at the beginning, it seemed to me there was a choice as to what kind of product it might be. And um, most people would go for a coffee table book, you know, a large format book, mm -hmm. with glossy paper, and it would sell for $120. Uh, this sells for 40. Mm -hmm. uh, and as you can see, it's on regular paper all the way, except the, the insets. It's a, it's a reasonable format in size. You could almost carry it with you. Yeah. So uh, I conceived of this as a humble book. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. in, a, in a rhetorical mood, in, in um, literature on sermons, mm -hmm. there is a mode of preaching called a sermon humilis. Um, this idea is developed by Eric Auerbach in the um, wonderful book called Mimesis. And a sermon humilis is a deliberate revolt against uh, high Latin, golden age Latin. Yeah. Uh, and um, at Amiens, yeah, there's a preacher that actually um, is the dean of the cathedral when the construction starts. His name was Jean Daville. And Jean Daville at one point says, I simply have simple words for simple people. Nobody likes to be called a simple person. <laughs> <laughs> but at the same time, uh, this um, was intended as a sermon humanist, not expensive. Mm. But then you pay that the downside of it is, as I said to you, I think um, earlier, I was a bit sad at the images, which could have been so much I don't know, so much brighter and clearer. But, um... Well, it's quite incredible, though, because obviously, you know, some of your audience will have gone to Amiens and visited the cathedral, but other members of your readership may not have. And so you actually provide a visual context of, you know, such a visual building. Yes, like I have not yet been to... Uh, Neither have I. <laughs> I've unfortunately only been to Notre Dame in Paris, thankfully before the fire of 2018. Yes. I actually went twice. Yes. So the last time I was there was uh, Christmas time 2018. 
So little did I know just a few months before, but I had my mold wine. I was at the Christmas market <laughs> overlooking, you know, just the holiday atmosphere. Mm-hmm. But yeah, your book, I mean, based off the minimal knowledge that I have in having experienced that one cathedral, one well, then the one, the church across the street, is it uh, San Severin with the yeah. twisted on the, on, on column? On the left bank of San Severin, yeah, with the twisted mm-hmm. column, and yeah, that's San Severin. Um, but, and then we, the little bit that we spoke about in our medieval course with Professor Bob uh, Mills, which kind of gave us a cursory gothic architecture and then we went into a bit more like of the medievalism uh as well as catalan gothic so we went to barcelona and looked at the gaudi uh, yeah wonderful architecture um, amazing it was really something um, at the cusp of covid as well so I, like, our last trip <laughs> honestly three weeks before everything shut down so extraordinary but yeah Sorry, long way to say that your book, though, with this limited experience of, you know, churches that I have off the Gothic style, loosely medieval style, um, I felt like I was there in a way that I could notice these things. And I can't wait till the world opens and I can go and have this kind of guide. It it always, Amiens, um, always was the English French cathedral in, in the sense the English have always loved Amiens. And um, it's uh, partly, I, I, I describe my work as Amia, it's coming from my um, uh, uh, Columbia core curriculum. But you know, when I had that motorcycle and I was traveling in Northern France, Amia or, or Beauvais would normally be you know, one of my first stops over there. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, there was a youth hostel, um, no, no longer exists, where I stayed in youth hostels at night and traveled on the motorcycle. Mm-hmm. And um, I, I used to go to Amia in that way. And um, so, um, uh, it's full of English tourists. <laughs> <laughs> so, so for our audience, you know, who, who may not have been able to go um, and who may not know a lot about the Amiens Cathedral, what would you consider like five essential moments in its life, in its Gothic life? Yes, I've thought a little bit about that in terms of five dates, five moments of time. And um, you can't avoid the first one. Um, and there's, there's no news about this. It's not my idea is not new here. Uh, 1220, um, uh, I think Amiens is about the only great cathedral that actually has a date written on it. <laughs> in fact, t- two times the date 1220 is written on it in, in, in inscriptions. That this was the starting date. Um, there's 800 years. Yeah, well, we celebrated its anniversary of supposedly all kinds of events last year, but you can imagine it didn't happen. Yeah. So, twelve is yeah. in the, it's set in the tiles of a labyrinth on the floor. There's a simulation of a labyrinth. Mm-hmm. And the octagonal plaque at the centre says, "In this year, twelve twenty, um, was the work begun." Mm-hmm. Interestingly, they get the wrong king. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> they attribute the king to um, Louis the VIII, Louis the Eighth, whereas in fact in 1220 Philip Augustus was still king, and nobody's ever been able to quite explain why they got that date so wrong. <laughs> I, I attribute it to the fact that Louis um, the Eighth was a local boy and his mother was from that area, so they must have considered him some kind of local um, asset. But anyway, it says that in the labyrinth 1220 the work was begun, and the master mason was Robert of Versailles. And after Robert of Brissage came Thomas, Thomas of Cormont, and after him came uh, Renaud of Cormont, his son. Mm-hmm. So 1220 is absolutely inescapable as the first date that you want to know. We don't know exactly when Brown's Cathedral was begun. Chartres, uh, we have a general idea. Beauvais, we know, was begun in 1225, but we don't have any inscription there. We, we've got a charter for 1225. Amiens is so unusual. And then running along halfway up the, tr- the south transept, there's a mutilated fragmentary inscription that includes the, de- the date 1220. Hmm. Second, second date, um, and this has to do with my story. I, I seek to, to animate my story, as I say, using a little bit of um, uh, film scenario, um, is I want to think of Amiens, I tell the story of the construction, as coming in two phases, incomplete completion, followed then by an extended later Middle Ages effort. So the incomplete completion uh, is marked, the end of that phase, by the occupation of the choir, by the clergy. Um, It took them 50 years to get back into the choir. And the laying of the pavement. And again, we have an absolute date for that. In the labyrinth itself, it says that Renaud of Cormont, the third master mason, laid the pavement in 1288. Mm -hmm. So 1288... 
Um, that's a pretty rapid building period. But Amiens, unlike most cathedrals, did not begin in the choir. So the clergy were left in exile for 50 years. And that fact, the clergy were all dying to rebuild their cathedral. They'd been at the Fourth Lateran Council. And they came back in, in 1215. They came back to Amiens with their heads full of reform and wonderful new buildings. And then their cathedral burned down. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and so you've got this desire, you've got to animate your plot through desire, and you've got the desire of the cathedral to have a building that, that embodies the spirit of church reform, and it embodies the Sermon Humanus. It's for preaching, it's for ordinary folk, and uh, you have to have the frustration of the clergy over a 50-year period until they can sit down again. Uh, so that makes my first chapter, which is bounded by those two dates. Mm -hmm. In 1272, this is not one of my five dates, but 1272, the relics of one of the most famous saints, St. Ulf, um, were, were translated into the cathedral uh, in 1272 in a great ceremony. So by 1272, in other words, 52 years after uh, the, the start of work, um, the choir is um, operative. The clergy are seated, they must have choir stalls of some kind. So first date, 1220, second date, 1288 for the pavement. Third date is one you've never heard of. And um, it's one I've um, emphasized in my book. Is in um, 1357 to 1358, um, a building account was made that lists the items of receipt and expense of the cathedral. And that's the only account that exists. When you build a cathedral, there's a, a, an accountant who keeps a record of the finances, like, you know, like doing income tax or something. Mm -hmm. uh, for, for some cathedrals, like Troyes, uh, the building accounts exist in large numbers through the Middle Ages. Westminster Abbey has its building accounts. Exeter Cathedral has its building accounts. It's from these documents that, in a sense, you can put your finger on the pulse of the economic uh, production of architecture by finding out where the money was coming from and who was doing it. 1257 to 8, that's one year after the Battle of Poitiers. You know, the mm, French has oh. gone with a crushing defeat. And um, it has to do with politics and cathedral building in the sense that cathedral building is institutionalized and is to some extent um, insulated from disasters like a, a battle. Uh, we have the names. I, I really love having names for people. We know that the master who um, directed the masonry, the, the master mason was Master Reginaldus. So we yeah. have Reginald the builder. We know that the guy that kept the account um, uh, was named Jacobus Pavus, Little James, Little Jim. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. So, so Little Jim is the canon, the member of the clergy, and he makes a list of all the items of income and all the items of expense. He records the work of Master Reginaldus, and he records the work of the glazier who's putting stained glass windows in. I, and I think I know which windows. His name was William, Master Guillermus. Mm. And you can find out where the money is coming from uh, and uh, nearly half the income is coming from collecting robes, garments that have been donated uh, to the church. Uh, Amiens was a textile producing city mm -hmm. and wealth in the city would be very much uh, expressed by uh, possession of garments, sumptuous robes and so on. Almost half the money for building comes from that. Money dropped in collecting boxes, mm -hmm. money carrying the relics out. There's an item of expense for having somebody to transcribe the letters of introduction for the people carrying out the relics, collecting boxes in the cathedral, relic quests going out into the countryside, and legacies, gifts mm -hmm. and money left to the cathedral. Mm -hmm. The sum of money is not very big. In that year, no major construction is taking place. I think I know where they were. And it comes in the second part of my story of construction. The first part is the getting the clergy in, into the choir, the incomplete completion. The second part is the kind of dragging out of the work because the building was not finished. And it went on with bits and pieces of building all the way through the later Middle Ages. So my, my building account is important simply as a document to show that second phase. Mm -hmm. The fourth date is 1470. And again, I, I'm thinking of the dynamics of my story is you've got to have desire. It has to be pulled forward by desire, by a desiring agent who wants something. But the clergy want their choir and they want to sit down. Mm -hmm. It has to be driven by fear. There has to be a terrible obstacle that's standing in the way of achieving what you want. Yeah. You want to achieve the entire cathedral. The building's incomplete at this point. Mm -hmm. You want to finish it. But there's a terrible thing going to happen. 
And what's in a, in a cathedral, what's that awful thing going to be? It's it going to be It collapses, yes. <laughs> Disaster. <laughs> In 1470, they realised that the um, crossing space, that's where the transept crosses the body of the building, is buckling. And there's a banana configuration in which the, the, the piers are leaning inwards at the lower level and outwards. We did scan this with a laser. And you don't need to scan it. You can see it with, yeah. the, with the naked eye. Um, and had the building not been pinned up with an iron chain, it's, <laughs> it, it, it runs halfway level all the way around the building, to stop those piers from moving inwards. And um, a, a new master mason uh, does this, uh, whose name is Pierre Tachissel. Pierre Tachissel saves the building uh, with the iron chain. And uh, the, we know the dean, the dean effectively is in charge of the operation, not the bishop, the dean. And the dean's name was Adrien de Enoncourt. And so again, we can, uh, it's all in my book <laughs> and the texts are in the book. Uh, uh, we can identify who are the agents of this um, saving the building. You bring the, the thing to an end then in 1530. This is my last, is that five dates? One, two, three, yep. <laughs> <laughs> we'll trust you, yeah. <laughs> 1530, um, the dean dies, Adrien de Enoncoeur. Um, I identify with him very much. He was the youngest son of a, of a local, I was the youngest son. And um, uh, his elder brother was supposed to inherit the estates. And so, as you know, younger sons are consigned to the church. Mm -hmm. uh, and so he was consigned to the church. Then he found to his surprise that his older brother died and he inherited vast estates and a lot of money. And he became a, a building dean. And so he was the dean in charge of fixing the building with the iron chain. He was in charge of refurbishing the choir, new choir stalls. Uh, the bit of the website which I love is the choir stalls. You can go around and you, mm -hmm. you every misericord and you can look at every bit of sculpture. He was the dean uh, who, who was in charge of that. Uh, he got old, as we all do. And then just two years before he died, uh, again, I'm identifying furiously. Um, what happened? He, the, the choir is finished. He's sitting in his lovely stall now. But damn it, a bolt of lightning hit the spire. No. <laughs> <laughs> so he was already emeritus at that point. And in my, in my story, there is a hound because his his house was called the House of the White Hound. Uh, so the dean has a hound, obviously. But he died in 1530, having helped provide the money for the mm -hmm. reconstruction. It was known as the Golden Steeple, the Clocher Doré. Mm -hmm. And uh, this was the age of Martin Luther. Obviously, when relics were not highly prized, and liturgy was under, was, was, you know, under attack and uh, the status of the clergy. Uh, and so in a sense, I see that wonderful steeple at Amiens as the dean thumbing his nose. <laughs> <laughs> at, at <Martin> Luther. <laughs> so in this way, there's my 300 year life of the cathedral. You've done an so, amazing job. <laughs> So like live and vivacious. Yeah. That's, it. That, that's it. Yeah. So that, those, those are my key dates. Brilliant. And so we know that because you stopped in um, 1530 that we have another half a millennia of time in that. That's it. That's of, it. Um, as you were saying, the Protestant Reformation, which a lot of Catholic cathedrals experience um, iconoclasm, you know, things being taken down. We had the French Revolution where Again, churches were repurposed um, or, you know, torn down, whatnot. And um, one of, if I'm recalling my history of Amiens correctly, was that the now famous um, floor work, the tiling was yeah. um, damaged or taken out with the labyrinth and then reinstalled in the 19th century with the That's correct. revival. That's and correct. We didn't have a question, surprisingly enough, about like the no, labyrinth, I, <laughs> I think, because it's just such a big part. But I was curious if you could talk about, because I believe it's in your first chapter, you talk about how the labyrinth and the tile work reflects the geometry and movement in the cathedral, but also the link of the Minotaur, which is a classical yes, yes. story, and Theseus. And then also we've briefly on our other episodes talked about the Name of the Rose, which the Umberto Eco book or novel and film where the library is a labyrinth. And yes. in your monograph, you say labyrinths are actually kind of 
everywhere in medieval marginalia and churches. And so I didn't know that. So I'm just also curious about that. Yeah, um, <laughs> there were many labyrinths in, in Gothic uh, cathedrals. Um, the only one that survives intact, as far as I know, is Chartres. Mm -hmm. has its labyrinth. And Chartres originally had in the center of it a bronze plaque with the Minotaur, you know, that explicitly um, rendered in the middle of, of the labyrinth. Mm -hmm. uh, Saint Quentin, the collegiate church north of that area, has a labyrinth heavily restored. Reims had a labyrinth, it was torn out in the 18th century because the kids were playing hopscotch on it, you know. <laughs> oh and, uh, dear. The, the clergy did not like that. Uh, Amiens. The, the, the labyrinth survived until the um, around 1830s, 1820s, 30s, and that was the worst moment in, in, in France as far as these buildings are concerned because the, the drive to conserve uh, had not yet um, gathered steam and uh, the, the, the cathedral floor was very worn. People do walk through cathedrals. It's interesting because the most worn area was the South Transept. The South Transept, where the lay people had, the lay folk had their headquarters in the South Transept, and uh, that was a major uh, point of entry. But the, the floor was worn, and presumably was go, it was becoming dangerous. It was torn out, and almost immediately afterwards, people regretted the fact they'd replaced it with just a plain stone pavement. So the, the drive, the, uh, the urgency began to, to um, make a replica of what was there. Fortunately, the, 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 the graphic. Um, uh, renderings of, of the floor. Unfortunately, the central octagonal plaque was conserved. Mm. And it still is in the in the local museum. I've measured the plaque and it corresponds exactly to the plaque in the labyrinth. So you can assume that the labyrinth is, is pretty accurate. Um, what does the labyrinth convey? Uh, oh, so many different things. So very many different things. Um, a black and white marble floor with dark, it's not actually marble, but it looks like it, with dark bands and white bands, is essentially a northern phenomenon. At this mm -hmm. time, Paris was using um, painted ceramic tiles, and um, we have some of them surviving still. The whole idea of a black and white marble floor is an indication of the extent to which uh, Amiens is not a Parisian building, and actually is talking to the Flemish structures up north, the stone itself comes from near Tournai, so Belgian stone. The artisans probably came from Tournai. Uh, and, and so this, the floor hold, is a visible expression of the, the counter-pull. Paris is sucking things in, and Amia is out there saying, well, we're not actually Parisian, we are Northern. Um, so that's one way of going at it. Um, another way of going at it um, is that the floor, in a sense, when you say it reflects, in a sense, I, I would say it counters a little bit uh, the geometry of the building. The, the aisles were perfect squares, and, and the, the, the basic geometry of the aisle base is squares. So you go down yeah, a series of square panels. The main vessel is also panels, but they do not correspond to the base system. And within each panel, there's a set of meanders that causes you to begin, as you walk forward, to begin to turn aside and begin to follow the meanders. Mm. So in the book, I contrast the ductus, the leading forward, the straight line, the building is sucking you forward with the stasis, which is the standing still and the following of, of, of bands, or the meandering, uh, that's yet another form. So in, in a sense, that the, 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 the floor counters that. Now, the, the, um, the, the actual uh, design of the labyrinth, labyrinths go back to antiquity, obviously, in early antiquity, but the actual form of the design, as I showed in my earlier book, um, the Cambridge Press book in 1996, there is a wonderful repeating pattern in it. And uh, you, you, you perform a series of loops in which there's a, in, your, in your first loop, um, you echo the last loop. Your second loop, you echo the penultimate loop. It all makes rhythmic sense. And I, I plotted it out in my 1996 um, Cambridge Press book. So there's a kind of dance that you do, and it's a rhythmic, symmetric dance. So if you're looking for an allegory mm -hmm. in this thing, um, you will say, well, you come in and you look at this and the dark writhing coils, you say, this is, there's no pattern, no form. And you watch people trying to follow it through and they give up after two minutes. It's too complicated. But then if you care to stop and study it, there is form in it. You know? An allegory for life. Life is full of winds and turns. And why did I go to Indiana Bloomington? Um, did that make sense? You know, uh, the, the, the labyrinth would encourage you to believe that there is actually some hidden sense in your life. And then to make it more directly relevant, liturgically, 
there's a recent one, well, not so recent, 10 years ago, it's a book by Craig Wright, a music historian at Yale. And he pointed out, uh, he picked up the rhythmic turns in the, um, uh, in the labyrinth, which uh, says he invented, he, he thought of that too. But he relates it to documented liturgical events at Easter time. And uh, oh, wow. uh, when we come to the portals, we'll find that the central portal is the Easter portal, mm-hmm. having to do with the resurrection of the body. You go through the resurrection of the body portal, and what you find behind it, directly behind it, are the two founding bishops, the tomb, lying in wait for their resurrection. And then behind that is the labyrinth. And um, in the documented cases of of liturgical practice, on Easter Sunday afternoon, uh, the clergy assembled at the labyrinth, and they had a thing called in the text a pilota. A pilota is something like football. Um, and I, I believe it rep- American football, that is, mm-hmm. a, uh, a rugby ball. Um, <laughs> I, I believe that this pilota represented the ball of twine uh, that um, uh, Ariadne g- yeah. gave to Theseus in order to escape from the labyrinth. And of course, um, Theseus is a prototype of Christ. And um, so the labyrinth is seen as a kind of redemptive mechanism in which you in which the church gives you, in which Christ gives you, um, the key to getting through the labyrinth successfully. And this is all embodied in the the greatest celebration of Christian year at Easter, in the dance on the labyrinth. Now, I went very carefully through the text, and yet I can't find the dance. I wish I could. I I do touch on it. The best chapter in this book is chapter six, the the liturgy. And uh, I do touch on it in my liturgy chapter. This, This was the most fabulous tool for animating the building. Imagine the dancing around the loops of the lab, the clergy are dancing led by the dean, and they're passing the ball between them. Oh, that's extraordinary. Amazing. And so articulately laid out, and also like Theseus Visual. defeats the Minotaur, and in a way, the allegorical comparison of overcoming sin and Satan, the monster or the beast, and that as well in the, the labyrinth, which is different than a maze, mm-hmm. um, which they're different words and maybe perhaps quite obvious, but I had to think about that and what the difference yes. is between those two. It also fits quite well because it's nearly Easter, so. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> it's so wonderful. Yeah. Um, Ello, why don't you? Yeah, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Fascinated. <laughs> I know my mind's humming. Thank you so moment. much for coming on the podcast. It's amazing. Um, so we were just continuing on um, with, the questions that we had for you. We were wondering if you could perhaps elaborate the politics, external and internal, that influence the construction of a major cathedral for our audience who may not know. Yes, in the message you sent, you mentioned Ken Follett as an example. Yes. Yeah, yeah, I did. Uh, I've uh, seen the series and I read the book when I was yeah. 16, the first one, yeah. Pillars of the Earth. Well, so. I, I have to tell you that as a serious academic um, person, which I am, uh, <laughs> I went to Ken Follett's book, really wanting to find that it was a bunch of nonsense, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, how dare a novelist write about this? And I have to say to my delight, or I don't know, um, astonishment, that it's a terrifically good book. Oh, and, oh um, good to know. Yeah. He um, <laughs> was advised by two very distinguished um, uh, historians, Warren Hollister on English 12th century politics. And so he really does have a pretty good understanding of the political push and shove, um, but he had a, a French person on Gothic architecture whose name was Jean Gampel, who talked to him about the essence of what Gothic is. So the two brought to the book a deep understanding of the dynamics of power in the 12th century, but Gampel brought to him uh, the, the nature of Gothic. And um, uh, I find it comes together very, very beautifully. Uh, and in terms of, of how it, um, my own work has picked up these themes, um, on the one hand, I would say to you, um, cathedral construction is to some extent insulated uh, from the push and shove. Uh, when the Battle of Poitiers takes place, it does not bring uh, everything to a crashing end at Amiens. When the Battle of Agincourt took place at Troyes, they were debating whether the steeple should have two stories or, or one story in it. You know, In other words, um, these great battles, victories, losses don't necessarily translate. Architecture is not the mirror of history. Right. Not, not at all. We shouldn't look at architecture as the product 
uh, of the forces of history. History is driven by architecture. It's, 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 it's the architecture is the force. And um, in my own work documented this, I think most effectively, in the contrast between Trois Cathedral, um, which was my first love, and Beauvais Cathedral. Uh, at Trois, the bishop was pretty much impotent he was pretty much impotent in the town. His ancestors, predecessors, had been chased out of the town by the count, and uh, there was a very powerful count of Champagne who had his palace um, in the city of Troyes, and the bishops only re-established themselves by giving up any pretensions to any real power in the city. Uh, so Troyes was essentially a soft, funded building, uh, funded by, uh, above all, by quests, by indulgences, by gifts of various kinds, uh, Beauvais, on the other hand, is completely the opposite. There, the bishop was count. He, he was one of the handful of count bishops. He controlled everything. And mm -hmm. Beauvais was a budding industrial city, uh, textiles, uh, mills producing flour and grain. Uh, uh, viticulture took place around Beauvais. And the bishop gained from all these operations. Every time a barrel of wine went through the, the gates, the bishop got it all. The bishop was enormously wealthy. Mm -hmm. and, uh, so um, those are opposite situations. Trois took many, many years to finish. This is a great unfinished project. Beauvais came to a spectacular early start, but then the bishop clashed with the king. It's a good story. Uh, the bishop, Miles of Nantes, was one of the people revolting against Louis IX, and um, uh, he was involved in sedition, and it's said that he accused the king's mother of uh, having an affair with the, with the papal legate. Oh, goodness. It's it, it, it said that the bishop accused the king's mother, Blanche of Castile, of, of actually expecting the, the papal legate's baby. And uh, uh, Louis IX was not pleased. Understandably <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> and Louis IX intervened in, in Beauvais at a time of struggle between the towns and, and the clergy. And he deprived, he dispossessed the bishop of his income. and. Um, uh, seized the bishop's palace, and the bishop had to flee. And as a result, the ambitious start at Beauvais was interrupted. And the whole story I tell at Beauvais um, is of a building that was really um, uh, formed by the struggle between the king and the, the bishop, in the sense that they started with one vision, it was interrupted, and then they went on with a different vision. And the fact that Beauvais collapsed is not unrelated uh, to this um, uh, to, to, to this political struggle. There is no inherent Gothic structural failure that produced Beauvais the collapse. It was the fact that the building was the result of a compromised design. Mm. So the, the political thing is, is important, uh, but it's complex. Right. And one really should avoid any kind of generalisms. You know, there's been a stream of thought in this country. Cathedrals were built on the backs of the labouring poor and that they, they, they were taking advantage of ordinary folk. And uh, the Marxist stream of thought is, has been sometimes expressed quite crudely. And uh, uh, it, it just doesn't work as a generalism. And so the best approach is just city by city to look at each building and realise that in each city there are diverse centres of power. The bishop, right. the count, the pope, the king. Uh, and it, each city is different. There's a different balance of power each time. That's wonderful to know, as well as the fact that Ken Follett's Pillars of the Earth is, yeah, it's it, quite, ha it has some merit to it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> well, it also has sex and violence. You know? <laughs> right. Well, and well, honestly, that was why I was very curious and wanted us to kind of include it as part of our question is yeah, because yeah. it has the romance and yeah. kind of, you know, the, the purple drama in it, which yeah. Ian McShane does beautifully in the television series. And yeah, yeah sometimes, you know, the um, detail to the actual architecture itself in book and film can get forgotten. Sure. And, you know, kind of just generalized, especially Ello and I had researched and talked about in numerous episodes how the medieval sometimes is such a unfortunate uh, suspect to, oh, it's just like a general medieval idea. You know, they all were monks running around doing this or, oh, it's medieval, so it's barbaric or something that's like it, that's that. That's it, yeah, that's it. At the end of chapters, um, in fact, in the epilogue, at the end of my Emmy book, I do propose a film scenario, but I, I'm not sure it has the kind of force of a um, Ken Follett novel. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know if you noticed the scenario I project at the end. 
Um, I do not recall off, uh, like all the details. And for our audience, it, 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 why it don't results you? results from my the fact that I identify with Adrien de Enoncourt. Uh, Fair enough. Team. And so he, he um, came through this terrible struggle to refurbish the choir. And um, he finally gets there and he saves the choir from collapse and the whole cathedral from collapse. So he's getting old, uh, as I guess I am. And he's sitting in his stall under his backside. He has a misericord. What, what's the misericord? It's Noah's Ark. <laughs> he's sitting in Noah's Ark. So Noah's Ark is a vehicle of salvation that saves us from the flood. So he's finally safe, you know. Uh, and then, as I say, the lightning strikes the, 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 the um, steeple and it comes down and it's fixed. But at the end, he's in his chair, he's done everything, uh, and he's half asleep during the liturgy. And there appears to him in a vision, in a dream, his famous predecessor, Jean Daville, who'd been the dean, uh, who had started the building 300 years earlier. Mm. And um, then uh, as they talk to each other in this vision, uh, their, their respective architects join them. Robert de Lesage comes along and explains exactly what he had in mind with this cathedral. And Pierre Tarissel, who was the last Gothic master mason, says, well, damn it, you got it wrong, didn't you? <laughs> <laughs> and the building would have fallen down. You've left us this. <laughs> and so you animate the whole 300-year um, life of the cathedral in this sort of vision and playing um, uh, playing the, the role of um, uh, Adrian de Enoco. I'd love to do it myself. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> I've persuaded Jeremy Irons to do it. Fair enough. A good alternative. Yeah, yeah I'm kidding. I haven't really got to. Uh, but then... <laughs> Who should play the uh, the old dean? I think it should be Derek Jacobi. You know. Oh yeah. <laughs> so when when oh, you meet no. them, maybe you could spin this scenario to them. <laughs> or you I, could I, use your son. He's in Hollywood. <laughs> <laughs> use this as your film pitch. <laughs> there we are. That's it. That's the that's like you, the film. Book. I feel like you've gotten all of the pillars of literature: sex, memory, death, motorcycles. Yeah. <laughs> 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 uh, that's brilliant I love that idea too of yeah the just kind of conversation yeah but different elements of history coming together and having a conversation because that is also what so much of like history and what yes. is is conversations a yeah. kind of continuous conversation that's it yeah and um one really kind of elemental aspect of your monograph is the conversation of the lay person with the church yeah, and absolutely. their experience. Yeah. And you spend so much time and detail on the portals into uh, Amiens. And personally for myself, I'm very interested by the St. Fama portal because I study saints. Sure. Um, and uh, St. Fama becomes the patron saint of Amiens. Yeah. And all of this, as well as the other... Um, portals the virgin mary one and then as you were saying we have the the main one in the center that's the the easter one if you could just talk about these extraordinary portals a little bit because they provide such a rich cultural knowledge mm -hmm. and experience for both people back in their you know medieval times the middle ages as well as today experiencing yeah. it or just looking at these photos that you provide both in your book and online yeah, I think that's a, 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 a fascinating line of thought. And um, as with everything else, it goes back to our, um, our childhood. In a sense, my father was a wonderful preacher. And um, he really could, uh, he used to put the sermon, make notes on the back of the envelope, and he'd make five points, and then he'd get up in the pulpit, and he wouldn't even need to use them as preaching. I'm envious of people like that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, um, <laughs> uh, and so this was uh, my, my book on the sermon is, is dedicated to my father. Uh, and so um, I was looking for some kind of underlying dynamic behind that preacher's sermon. And I found it um, described in a book called Soldiers of Christ by Larissa Taylor. And she comes to the, the, the characteristic trope, the characteristic mechanism, the characteristic um, trick, if you like, uh, of a good preacher. Uh, and that is to offer a negative anthropology. That's to say we're all messed up, you know. We are <laughs> and, and we find it very easy to buy into that. 
that. You know, well, we're all messed up. And um, you, you, you offer, the, 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 you come to a negative anthropology with a positive soteriology, a wonderful word, soteriology, the, the pursuit of salvation, um, in which everything is possible for the repentant sinner. And it seemed to me, um, underlying the kind of apparent random structure of the sermon, because it's repetitive, and he wanders around here and there, it's full of imagery, and he appeals to his audience in all kinds of ways. But underlying that is that dynamism. And that what I realized is that the portals of Amiat reflect that, mm-hmm. in the sense that you begin with Adam and Eve, and they're there, you know, they're there in, in the right-hand portal, in the trummo, uh, the central column, the central support. The Virgin Mary tramples the beast, tramples the serpent, and below them is Adam and Eve. So you've got the original sin. You know that's going to lead to damnation, and there you've got that in the um, in this last judgment. But then the preacher offers you three avenues of salvation, which actually correspond to the three portals. <laughs> The, the first one is you don't have to end as badly as you began. And we know that um, uh, Mary Magdalene began very badly in, in, the, in the fiction pre- spread in the Middle Ages. She was a prostitute, which, of course, she wasn't. But um, she ended as the apostle of the apostles and mm-hmm. uh, privileged to see the resurrected Christ. So she began badly. Judas Iscariot, on the other hand, began very well, but he ended very badly. So you've got to mend your ways. you know. So how do you do that? You follow virtue. And you avoid vice, and there they are laid out for you in the center portal. And the vices um, are, are touch you know, lust, it's right there, you know, uh, avarice, it's right there. The, the um, virtues are a little higher, and their personifications are a little more abstract. If you follow virtue and avoid vice, you will build your life on the model of the apostles, who have themselves built their life on the model of Christ, who's right there in the middle. And, and sure enough, the apostles all look like they're a bit stamped out, you know, mm-hmm. the cookie cutter kind of approach, and they're all <laughs> people who built their life uh, in the um, image of the central Christ. And the preacher says he's, 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 a, he's a proto-capitalist because he says, this is the most amazing bargain, is you can't not do this, simply because, you know, you realize that the apostles all paid for their, their salvation through martyrdom. You, on the other hand, you don't have to pay for your salvation, just follow virtue. But then he goes on to say, but it won't hurt, it won't hurt if you drop a coin in the box. <laughs> will certainly help too. So one of the three avenues of salvation, the the the, um, the, the, the portal of the good works, and here um, uh, Amiens is following Paris, the central portal mm-hmm. of Notre Dame is absolutely the same structure. But Amiens is much more systematic than Paris because the, frankly, Paris, it all gets muddled up in, in the lateral portals. Uh, Amiens is absolutely systematic because the other portal of the other path of redemption is the presence of the saints. Not just any old saints, but these are our saints. You know, St. Fermin, uh, he's here. He's right here in the choir. Um, you, you can go through the portal of St. Fermin and go down into the uh, ambulatory. And there, high above the altar, in a raised up gallery, uh, is the chasse, the relic box. And there is um, uh, not just Fermin, but all the other great saints. The wonderful female saint you should look into is St. Ulf uh, or Ulfia. And um, she's there, and her image is on the portal. So the saints are there for us, and um, uh, the miracles associated with the saints are available today. They will intercede for you. And um, then f- finally, there's the Virgin Mary. And she's not just any old Virgin Mary. She's Again, she's your Virgin Mary. This is Sainte Marie d'Amiens. And she's a, there's a wonderful passage in the sermon where he tells you exactly that, what the Virgin Mary can do for you. It's very beautiful. She rescues captives. She looks after women. She picks up those who fall down. The Virgin Mary is, she, the Virgin Mary rocks, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and she, um, that figure on the right-hand board clearly became an apotropoic, um, embodying force and power, the most forceful, most powerful figure in the whole portal. Uh, she has 26 layers of paint on her. Wow. 26 wow. layers of paint. So it means to say that she was the one that got the attention of, of donors and so on. Paint it again, make it come alive. Mm-hmm. And um, we know from the written sources that a great lamp was hung from the voussoirs above. Uh, and at dusk time, the lamp would be hung so that the Virgin Mary would be illuminated while everything else went into darkness, brightly coloured and illuminated, and that the devout folk would gather to venerate the Virgin Mary. So those are your three mechanisms of salvation, and they come from the sermon. And it works for all the three portals, which um, uh, 
uh, I was very pleased with that notion at the time. Uh, if I had to republish that little book, I would point out more fully the extent to which the preacher's words do not correspond. Uh, um, he does not talk specifically about the local saints. And in a sense, the story of the local saints is one um, that, uh, apart from St. Firm in the Martyr, most of them are kind of forgotten after a while. There are saints there you've never heard of, uh, and we don't know what they did and why are they there. St. Ash, St. Asher. Does anybody know who they were? You know. <laughs> That goes for a lot of different saints in different spaces, though, especially the earlier saints, when yeah. as long as you were popular, you were a yeah. saint. <laughs> yeah. Well, we can confirm these uh, suppositions by the fact that um, a, a PhD was done at Columbia some years ago by Mary Jane Chase on the inventories of personal possessions of bourgeois of Amiens. And they had in their possession images of the Virgin Mary, John Baptist, Firmin the Martyr. They do not have images in their possession of all the different saints mm -hmm. up there. If I recall correctly, based off your uh, text, the, is it the head of St. John the Baptist was at? It's, it's still there. It's, it was brought from the Crusades, correct? Yeah, yeah, it was sent back in 1204. And you must understand that's the real head. Everywhere else there are fakes. <laughs> this is the one and only. This, this is the one and only. Don't, don't bother with the other ones. <laughs> I, but I did not know that until I read your... Yeah. Um, uh, it's still there. And that's just extraordinary. Um... It, it was supposed to be destroyed in the revolution. Uh, uh, but the mayor, whose name was uh, Alexandre Lescouvet, was a Catholic. And so he, he, he took it to, to, to destroy it. But he hid it under his bed until, <laughs> until the end of the revolution. And then he gave it back to the cathedral. That's great. I can't help but just think if this is the one and only head, it, brain is immediately going to Lord of the Rings and the one and only ring. So this is oh, yeah. not the head to rule them all. <laughs> but, um, and the way that you're describing the portals and, you know, just thinking of the images and sculptures um, telling the stories, again, returning to the name of the rose, there's the scene quite early on where our young protagonist enters through a portal and is caught and mesmerized by the images there and has this little, it's quite a long passage because he gets lost, but he says that images are literature for the layman. Absolutely. Kind of a, a paraphrase, yeah. but... Yeah, absolutely. Something... Oh, John, John Ruskin said something very much like that. The portals are sermons in stone. Oh, I love that too, especially with the alliteration of the S's. Yeah. And as we spoke yesterday, you use Ruskin as your um, interlocutor or Ciceroni yeah. or guide. That's it. Yeah, that's it. Through and around the cathedral, which I love that idea. I love that having someone kind of usher us around and I you feel, also are. yeah yeah exactly that's what I was gonna say I feel like you're our inter interlocutor in this case you really uh, I, 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 as you can see in the introduction the acknowledgements of my book I've had such a wonderful time with so many people uh, um, not just at Amiens but um, and Amiens is one of the series of buildings I've worked on uh, and uh, the greatest joy of all is sharing it uh, with your students with your family and uh, both of my children actually were deeply uh, uh, their lives were moved very much by this because um, we, when they were small, they stayed with us in France a good deal. Oh, oh. I had an NEH fellowship. We lived for uh, seven or eight months in Beauvais when I wrote the Beauvais book. And, uh, oh. My daughter first went to school in Beauvais. Wow. That's amazing that it like had such a life like Long impact. impact. Yeah, yeah. And what yeah. a wonderful thing to have become quite unique part of in a way. Yeah. 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 I'm jealous. <laughs> thank you so much for being so visual in your description and I, I think that that's yeah, not a bit. to help any listener yes see it. I could listen to you talk about forever <laughs> yeah not just Amiens but all of your research yeah non-stop um before we ask our final series of questions for you is there anything else that we haven't asked that you would like to share about Amiens or your other research i mean your prolific long academic career well, I, I, i'd like to thank you very much for pulling me in to this experience because frankly i've been retired now for two and a half years and you know covid cut across the whole thing i kind of felt so isolated i'd always imagined uh, having retired that i'd be popping up and down to the city not every day but you know once a week once every two weeks mm -hmm. working at the library continuing these things and um what you've done is to um, encourage me to do, uh, this is, I think, the 
third Zoom conversation I've ever had. <laughs> for some You're reason, a pro. Yeah, for some reason, I, I was um, not wanting to get into this. And um, so that's that's my main thought, is I'm, I'm grateful oh. for your initiative. Well, thank you. No, we're yes, really thank you. And we're glad it's been a good experience. Yeah. Because <laughs> Zoom, it is such a different way of interacting. Yes, it, yes. Um, there's something intangible missing yeah. even in yeah. person. But um, Ello, why don't you go for the final home run hitting yeah. question we always ask? <laughs> so to all our guests, we always ask the following question, but um, in your case, we're going to make it a bit more ample. So we always ask our interviewees their, about their favorite medieval fact. So we were going to like adapt this to you and ask what your favorite fact about Amiens Cathedral is, and as well, what your favorite medieval fact is, if you have one. Yes, um, but the notion of a fact is, um, I, I would want to expand that a little bit. Fair enough, um, go for um, it. <laughs> well, the, 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 the phenomenon, uh, the, the, the phenomenon about Amiens that gave me most pleasure when I discovered it, the, the unscrambling of the um, geometry, certainly, uh, that, that was fabulous. And uh, I measured out the building with um, James Addis and we drew the thing up on a large scale. And then I was mucking around with a cardboard template. Um, trying to see how the different parts of the building related. And with that cardboard template, I began to realize the importance of that enlarged crossing space and uh, how it fitted the, the really generated the extensions of the transept arms and the choir. And they, that was a great joy. But you know, when I was doing that work and working on the text and documenting it, at one point, uh, one evening, I, I was spending months in Amia, and uh, after a hard day's work, I drew withdrew to the um, North transept, and the sun was going down. And you know, I sat in the north transept and I thought to myself, you know, you've measured the building, you've recorded all the, I've made, recorded all the circumferences of all the little columns in the triforium, you've read all the text, the archives, and you've done all that, but somehow, you know, you've really missed the point. And, uh, and um, in a sense, this sort of joy, I'm so lucky that I had a chance to come back at it because my Cambridge book came out in, uh, 1996, and it was a standard academic monograph. Very, I think, definitely professional, very nice, but it missed the point. And so, my, my favorite phenomenon, where I begin to think I'm beginning to forget the point, is, is the discovery of performances in the building, uh, of which the most fascinating one involves L'homme vert, the green man. Mm -hmm. Green man. And uh, the green man uh, was a personage dressed all in green. And he'd appear in the cathedral choir on the feast of St. Fermin, the invention of the relics of St. Fermin the Martyr. And he would put a foliate crown on the heads of all the clergy and incense would be uh, wafted through the choir in memory of the miraculous change of a cold January day into a summer-like day where all the trees came into leaf and, and the, um, the flowers came into bloom and the air was full of wonderful odours and sick people came out and were healed at the passage of the relics as they moved from the tomb where they'd been buried into the cathedral at the translation of the relics. So the green man, Lumber, this was a celebration that took place on uh, January 13th and <clears throat> as time went on, it became popularised. And it, it expresses the kind of enthusiastic relationship between the townsfolk and the cathedral. It became a little bawdy that the green man would be chased out of the building by, by a crowd that would try and grab his clothes off him, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so he'd race out into the streets running and chased by a series of pursuers. And this was the time, this was an amorous time in Abbey Island. This was the traditional time when young people became engaged, you know. Mm -hmm. and, um, so the whole phenomenon of the Green Man, I was aware of it. It actually is in my old Cambridge Press book. But I became much more aware of that kind of affective relationship between uh, the, the people and the cathedral and the cathedral clergy. As time went on, as I worked on the sermon, and then this last spell, I, I carefully went through a massive amount of work in the archives uh, on um, uh, notes on liturgy that were written by an 18th century canon, member of the clergy, whose name was François Villemain. And Villemain was sad to see all these wonderful medieval uh, celebrations were being disbanded. And so he wrote them all down. And that's how we know about them. So you'll find I've, I've transcribed some of the texts in chapter six of my book. Uh, in other words, this was recorded just at the time 
that it was disappearing. I sent a copy of my book um, to my brother David, who was a vicar, retired in the Church of England. And I said, look, you must read chapter six. David hasn't read much of whatever I've ever written. I thought <laughs> six would be good for him. And he, he, he wrote back to say he loved it. And he, was, he loved the way um, in which it, the church at that point was enthusiastic. You know, it summoned the enthusiasm of the ordinary folk. And he contrasted it with the current liturgy, which uh, I don't know, as, as a child, I never found it very engaging. But um, <laughs> I've lived with it all my life. And as I get older, yeah, it seems more engaging as well. But the whole idea of a kind of enthusiastic relationship between the townsfolk and the liturgical performance in the cathedral. That's my phenomenon or fact <laughs> for the building. The Middle Ages in general, I'm going to take this back to my tutor in Oxford, Eric Stone, Anthony Hopkins, he reminded me of. Um, <laughs> he'd written this one article uh, uh, in, the, in the 1962 Transactions of the Royal Historical Society. Uh, it was a long article, and I read it many, many times. Uh, it was called Profit and Loss Accounting in the Estates of the Priory of Norwich. Isn't that an inspiring title? <laughs> <laughs> It's a great hook. It pulls you right in. <laughs> Profit and loss accounting in the estates of the Priory of Nor Norwich. But what he came up with was absolute dynamite. Um, he'd been um, educated in a kind of Marxian way of thinking. Um, his time at Manchester apparently helped him develop this, um, in which he saw the kind of economic documents of the past, in this case, manorial accounts, as a source from which data could be extracted to allow you, in a sense, to put your finger on the pulse of a medieval society. Mm -hmm. and, and so he systematically and intensely went after these manorial accounts. In England, these begin already quite early, certainly by the late 1100s, by the 1200s, uh, they, they begin to exist in large numbers. And it has to do with the realization that land is a productive resource that can produce cash. So if you are a bishop and you have estates all over the country, you can choose to put the estate out to farm under contract. And you'll just say to the, to the person in charge, give me a, a fixed salary, a fixed payment at the end of the year. It's yours. Get on with it. Or you can appoint an agent who manages it, manages it for you and they are responsible for every last item of expense. And you'll see, you must write it all down. And in doing that, we're going to keep an eye on you and see much, how, how much uh, profit you're making at the end of the year. So from this, the, the phenomenon that I'm reaching is critical to medieval modern in the sense that what you get to is this old idea of a feudal society, ignorant people bartering their pigs and chickens and selling their, and, and their services um, it is all to be reconsidered. That capitalism is something well developed already in English 12th century. England was a pioneer in the systematic use of accounting far ahead of France. And then uh, this is followed up by yet another extraordinary article I read as an undergraduate at the recommendation of Eric Stone. He liked to put us under very arcane, difficult things. Uh, there was a woman called Ada Levitt, a pioneering woman in the field of Marxist thought, or Marxian thought. I believe she was um, warden of St. Hilda's College at Oxford for a while, Ada Levitt. And she wrote a, 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 an article on the estates of the Sea of Winchester in which she made a systematic case that the transformation of the estates, the commutation, for the cash rents as opposed to um, so-called feudal services, uh, took place driven by a force. And she is working with the 14th century. And the force in the 14th century, what's, what's that going to be? Is it going to be the Black Death, the population diminished by a third or so, that's driving the clergy now to, to um, make cash rents? Is it the Black Death? No, she says, more important than Black Death is the Bishop of Winchester needs money. He needs money. Why? He needs cash to build. He's a building bishop. He needs the cash to build the nave of Winchester Cathedral and his other, and many other building projects. So this whole idea that you could systematically go over texts and extract from them a kind of dynamism um, that um, allows you to understand and get beyond the platitudes that we, we, we churn out, like you, I'm endlessly irritated by the use of medieval as a synonym for you know, primitive, barbaric, crude and so on. Um, but then you take that mentality of that kind of approach over into the study of buildings, and it produces a kind of systematic study of the details of the building, mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. uh, in order to, again, to put your finger on the pulse of production. And there you see that a cathedral like Amiens is going up at the same time that the clergy is systematizing its exploitation of its agrarian estates. It's going up with an industrial revolution affecting the way textiles are produced in Amiens. Amiens is one of the biggest textile production areas. Uh, and the clergy are involved in all this. And th this mentality is carried over into construction. So this um, is not exactly a fact, but it's a phenomenon. Mm -hmm. um, but unfortunately, uh, that's an exciting phenomenon, but unfortunately, the study of this is a kind of study of details. And um, it's, you could say you can't see the forest for the trees. Uh, so uh, I'm afraid it would, I was very committed to the study through my early career. I still am, but uh, early on I was fanatic about it, measuring everything out and so on. But it does produce in the end that sinking feeling that I had in the North Transit of Amiens. Oh gosh, you've done everything, but you've missed the point. So in, in the end, I'm happy that I was allowed to have the second part of my productive career, a little bit to go beyond that first part. And there the media, the digital media, not just for the websites, but, but for the kind of thinking. And uh, so that's my favorite phenomenon of the Middle Ages. So to look at the period as exciting, as engaging, as ours, the buildings are there, they invite you to go in. You know, it's not just something in the past. It's not a dead body on a uh, on an operating theater or whatever that we analyze. It's, it's, it's living, it's with us. Wow. wow. <laughs> I, I want to like clap and yeah, say, me too. bravo. <laughs> yeah, incredible. Do you know, I miss the classroom. I do, I, I, it's been a year, two and a half years, I do, I dream about teaching. I had this big course called Medieval Architecture. And I I'm could sure you put, were amazing. I yeah. Could, I could pull, stu I pulled 60 students at a time into my medieval architect. These are American students who have not, see not seen many of these buildings. Yeah. Uh, right. I, yeah, I, I do miss it, that. And so thank you for just allowing thank me. You. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you. It has been an honor, an honor, a treat. Yeah. So inspiring and um, just truly lovely. And if you ever want to come, chat wow. at a classroom of two uh, <laughs> we'd more love than... to have you <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, um, one last thing i've been working with a former student um, on an animation of notre dame of paris okay and, uh, uh, it, it, with that student's permission um, i'll send you the link yes yes uh, we would love uh, that put my love voice that. over on it it's going to be used for a fundraising i'm on the board of the friends of notre dame of paris we're going to use it as a fundraising device but um i i think we can show it already but um uh, let me see if I can get you that link. That would be wonderful. Um, yeah. If so, Notre Dame could be a whole other thing. We did listen to your podcast that you guessed it on about right after the fire. Yeah. But with the times since, so much has kind of changed and not changed, but perspectives on how to rebuild the cathedral, what you rebuild, what you don't rebuild, conservation versus preservation versus bringing in the new technology and the new, right. Um, right. And what do you do with a behemoth? That is something like Notre Dame. That is this kind of yes. representative, not just for Paris and it, like France, but for kind of Gothic cathedrals Absolutely. as a whole. Yeah. So, yeah, like I said, that's a whole other can of worms. Yeah, but... um, yeah, another kettle of fish. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> brilliant. Well, is there anywhere or anything we will provide links for mapping Gothic as well yes. as the Amiens right. accompanying website and links to your book? Is there anywhere else that you can be found that you would like yeah, to well, share? Maybe provide a link to the Friends of Art, um, Friends of um, Notre Dame of Paris website. I sure. can give you that. Most definitely, yes. Because the animation will go up there. We've got an event to celebrate the um, second anniversary of the fire. And um, wow. uh, I'm not sure whether, whether they will want to hold the um, final version of the animation until after that. I've got to talk to the president of the board. But um, uh, that website already has a guided tour of Notre Dame where I narrate it. Really? Wow. Wow. That's amazing. I'm going to go look, listen I to know. this now. I'm definitely <laughs> going to follow Google up friends, on that. Friends of Not just Google Friends of Notre Dame. But the best be. way to find the Amiens website um, is just Google Life of a Cathedral. Yeah. Okay. If you just Google Life of a Cathedral, it's there. Brilliant. But they're having to fill in the um, www. Blah, 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 blah. Yeah. Sure. Please. Wonderful. Well, thank you. For the umpteenth time. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> thank you so much. Good Such luck, a pleasure. Um, sincerely, with your PhDs, good luck with the whole future of the academia. 
thank you thank you thank you so much thank you sincerely thank you very much i enjoyed it wonderful (laughs) Bye 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 So if you've enjoyed this episode and want to listen to more, please know that you can find us on Spotify, Apple Podcast, Amazon, Audible, and um, YouTube by typing Modern Medieval Podcast. You can also interact with us should you have comments, um, thoughts, or ideas, or criticisms. All are welcome on our social media platforms. We've got facebook we've got both a page and a group just type modern medieval podcast you can email us by typing modern.medieval.podcast at gmail.com you can find us on instagram by typing podcast.modern.medieval and twitter i think twitter yeah yes (laughs) (laughs) so you can find us at twitter under the handle at medieval underscore modern where we keep up to date with all our information And just a final concluding thought that you can find Professor Stephen Murray's final book that was the anchor of our conversation about uh, Notre Dame of Amiens, Life of a Gothic Cathedral. It is published by Columbia University Press, so available on that website as well as Amazon and wherever else you purchase your books. We hope you enjoyed this talk. Yes, we really do. So until next time, I'm Megan. And I'm Ella. And this is Modern Review of the Podcast. Do 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 do